Good morning and welcome. It is so good to see you. We have a lot of folks, uh, and as Amy said earlier, some that uh, are not here every Sunday, so we're honored that you're here today. Uh, see a number of Winston folks back in that corner, uh, including Randy and Deborah, who always sit there, so <laughs> you're trying to confuse me. <laughs> it's not too difficult. Uh, just so, so good to have you. Uh, where's the, the law firm from High Point? I know. There you are. I may need you. I don't <laughs> it is good to have you. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, Herb Thomas today, where, there you are. Herb brought me and they're, they're down on the altar in a Ziploc. Uh, a lot of pocket crosses, a whole lot of pocket crosses that you were invited, if you would like, to take. And just put in your pocket and from time to time reach in there and touch it and remember you're not alone. So there they are for you or for you to give to others. Uh, came from a, a company in Moxville, you said, that does, uh, what is it, uh, Fuller, Fuller Metals. So we thank them and I thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I saw Bob and Becky Roach out there. Reverend Bob Roach, who has had such a distinguished career in the Western North Carolina Conference, and we've known each other since we were young, which was, you know, the late 1800s, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, a friend like a brother, and, and Becky is by far his better half, and it's so, so good to see you. They, they're up from Hickory. Um, Rebecca McNeely. Family. Rebecca had the unenviable task some time ago of photographing me for a PR thing and trying to make me look good, which is when I think she decided to change professions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's good to see you. Uh, Bill and Betsy Joyner, welcome. And I look around, so many, I can start, if I start calling names, I leave out so many. And, uh, and so I apologize. <laughs> Golly, it's good to see all of you who are here today. Thank you for being with us. And those who are worshiping online, uh, we're so glad to have you. Uh, Frank Wright was talking to me earlier about some folks who told him recently that this is now their church, you know, that, that for, for reasons uh, really beyond uh, what they would have chosen necessarily, they are in more than out. And, uh, and they found church here. And what a great church to find. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, a dear friend from New York uh, this past week said, you're asking folks there if they want to become affiliate members, I want to become an affiliate member. Uh, she said, I watch you every Sunday. That's my church. You're my pastor. Why can't I be an online affiliate? And I guess that's fantastic. So thank you, Sandy. Uh, we have some people all summer long. I, I don't know. Bill said, sends me, Bill, uh, the, the list of where we're having viewers. And we've had people all summer, virtually every Sunday, from Switzerland. Uh, whoever you are, bring chocolate back. <laughs> <laughs> but that's fantastic. And uh, Paige today, is, uh, she, we talked earlier, she said she would be watching from... Turkey, so uh, hi, and I assure you I've not done whites and colors together, but, <laughs> but I miss you. Uh, you see a note here, we are uh, recognizing affiliate members. It's not like joining a church, you're still a member of your church, so there are no baptisms or vows of membership or things like that, but it shows that in a, an official capacity you are part of this family uh, and uh, accepting responsibilities and sharing your dreams and, and becoming part of the fabric of this life. And that excites me and I know it does everybody else. And we're, the next two Sundays, we're gonna be recognizing people uh, who would like to, to make official the relationship you already have. Uh, so if, if you're interested, uh, email me. You see my, my email address on the back. <laughs> of the bulletin. 
and we'll make sure that you are in, in one of those two Sundays. Okay, I think that's it. I have little notes. Look at that. Uh, crossword puzzle. We're so, so glad to see each and every one of you. Let's say a prayer together. We are thankful, oh God, for this place, for this time, for this occasion. I thank you for these people, and I pray that you will be here in a way too powerful to deny, touching us, equipping us, and sending us forth to live as your disciples in your world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymns number 185 ask you to stand as able. Confess our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. I did miss one earlier. Uh, where's Reverend Earl Davis? You're here somewhere. In, out, under. There you are. Welcome. Glad you're here. Thank you. Let's join together in a time of prayer. In the sacred nature of this moment, O oh God, and the beauty of this place, we, your people, join together in a prayer of thanks. We thank you for the gift of life in all its fullness, for family and friends, laughter and love, healing and hope, the grace and gifts we did not earn but daily enjoy. For more than there is time to name, we are profoundly thankful. You, dear Lord, are better to us than we have any right to ask, and we offer you our heartfelt praise. We also ask that our gratitude will not be empty words, but rather that it will take form in how we live among others. May we offer to family and friends the strength they, they need for the daily journey. <coughs> May we not only receive, but also become sources of laughter and love for our neighbors. May we do our part to heal broken relationships and to become beacons of hope to a broken world. May we be as gracious to one another as you are to us, forgiving and loving with no strings attached. And may we celebrate our gifts, not by building bigger barns in which to hoard them, but by opening wider arms through which to share them. On the mountaintop, in the valley, and on the daily plain that lies between, we sense your presence. In that is our life, our hope, and our victory. This we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As the ushers come forward, I want to take just a moment. You folks know the ministries that you support with these offerings. Uh, life transforming, life giving, sometimes life saving. Such an important array 
of institutions throughout the high country that give life back to people. But those of you online, I want to take just a moment today and chat with you about this. Uh, you can do more than just bringing chocolate back. Uh, <laughs> on your screen, up to the upper right, right, there is a button that says uh, donate. Uh, you can hit that and be part of this ministry. Uh, and it's not that we want to take your money. We want to use your money uh, as a symbol of your faith to reach out and touch lives and heal lives and help lives. And we want you to be a part of everything that we're doing here. So you're invited to give, even as I know you will. Thank you all for your generosity. Let us pray. God, use what we give to make ours a better world. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. The 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, there's the Good Shepherd passage, Jesus talking to the disciples and using shepherd and sheep language, beginning with verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. And we'll explain in a minute what that meant, but all beneath the Good Shepherd imagery. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture, safety. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it in its fullness." The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Oh God, speak to me that I may hear. Speak through me that we may hear. And having heard, make us doers of the word and not hearers only. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I like all sorts of music. Well, I like most sorts of music, uh, particularly the sort of stuff we've heard today. That's just, I mean, if we pronounced the benediction and went home, this would be a great service. We're not going to. <laughs> but it would still be a great service. It's just remarkable music, which we have every week. Uh, I love church music and classical music and soft rock music, you know, Gordon Lightfoot and Joan Baez and people like that, the Drifters. And, uh, I like some country music, and I've always enjoyed Reba McIntyre as a country artist. I think you can use the word good about her in a number of ways. She has a good voice. She sings good music. She's had a good career in TV and movies. She's a good entertainer. From what I read, she's a good person. She was interviewed not long ago on one of the morning shows. I, it was either the Today Show or CBS Morning Show. I don't remember which. But uh, uh, she has experienced incredible success. And she's had more than her share of uh, hard times and heartache and she was asked about the role of faith in dealing with the hard times and the heartache. And she said, I do more praying before I get a bed, out of bed in the morning than a lot of people probably do all day long. The interviewer asked, well, why is prayer so important? And she said, I want to know before my first foot hits the floor that wherever those feet go for the rest of the day, God's going with me. I thought, that's not a bad philosophy of life. Not a bad theology. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. It's called providence. And she believes in that. Well, interview went on, and at some point, the interviewer said, you know, you have survived a lot of tough times, and, and in the midst of it all, you have thrived as an entertainer, as a person. What do you have to do to survive and thrive? <clears throat> and Reba said, to survive and thrive, you have to have a wishbone and a backbone and a funny bone. And I thought, that's a pretty good sermon outline. 
I'm going to use that blowing rock. <laughs> so today we're going to take a look at the gospel according to Reba, which pairs pretty well with the gospel according to John and the passage that we read a moment ago where Jesus is in one of the good shepherd uh, illustrations. He's talking to his disciples about what that means, and he says, I am the gate of the sheep. Uh, you go in and out and find pasture. The gate is that which locks behind the sheep once they're in the fold to protect them. I am your protector. That's the gate. You go in and find pasture. That's provision. I give you the food that you need most of all. I am the shepherd who watches over you. And Jesus, in that good shepherd mindset, said to the disciples, now here's what I want for you. I have come that you might have life in its fullness. That's the faith that we want to access and remember before the first foot hits the floor in the morning. But once our feet are on the floor, we got to go someplace. we got to move in some direction. So what direction do you and I take in order to receive what Jesus said he wants to offer. I've come that you may have life in its fullness. What do I have to do to reach out and take that? Well, according to Reba, three things. First of all, you've got to have a wishbone. She was talking about dreams, goals, aspirations that draw us beyond ourselves to become better selves than we otherwise could be if we failed to dream. Uh, many of you are golfers. Uh, you therefore surely appreciate Gary Player and the tremendous legacy that he has. At one point, you remember the big three were Palmer, Nicholas, and Player. Gary Player was kind of born into the world with this natural ability. And he could have been a good golfer if he just used his natural ability, but he didn't want to be a good golfer. He wanted to be a great golfer. He could have made some money uh, by just doing his best with what he had, but he didn't want to make some money. He wanted to win some tournaments. In fact, he didn't want to win some tournaments. He wanted to win a lot of tournaments. He didn't want to win a major, maybe, someday. He wanted to win majors, plural. So what did he do with this lofty dream? He said that he practiced every day hours and hours and hours, hitting hundreds of tee shots and hundreds of shots from the rough and hundreds of fairway irons and woods and hundreds of wedges from the sand until his hands would bleed. And then he would put band-aids on the parts that were bleeding and that's when he would practice his putting. And Gary Player became Gary Player as we know him because not just he had the talent, a lot of people have the talent, but he had this massive dream that drew him into something beyond what he otherwise would have been had he just settled for, eh, I'll do my best. There's something about having a dream that calls us forward to become more than otherwise we would be that's absolutely sacred that helps us find life in its fullness. And you never outgrow that, you know? Uh, at my age, at any age, you never... When I was in Asheville, there was a couple there. He was in his early 90s. She was in her 70s. They were delightful. They were funny. They picked on each other all the time, very lovingly. And uh, one day, I remember, I was in a, a, a group of people, and they were there. And one of the men in the group was talking about how important it is to have goals and to go for those goals. And the man made the statement, without a dream in your life, you're just as good as dead. Well, this guy, early 90s, uh, looked at him and he said, I'm in my 90s. What kind of dream am I supposed to have? What kind of goals do you think I should set at this point in my life? And just like that, his wife said, let me answer. She said, let's just bring it home. It doesn't have to be some global dream. Let's just talk about where you live. And he's looking at her, and we're all kind of grinning because we know what's coming. She said, how about this? In your life with me, 
the dream of being less stingy and the goal of being more generous. <laughs> and they laughed just like you did, all of us did. But she kind of made a point, as did the guy who brought it up to begin with. You don't outgrow the benefit of dreaming and goal setting uh, every day. I, I, you know, dreams, goals, aspirations, I call them plans. Every morning when I get up, I have a little app on the phone called Daily Task. And every morning I write down five or six things. And they may be big things. <coughs> uh, work on a book that's due or uh, write part of Sunday sermon or make some pastoral phone calls or they may be not so big things. Uh, pick up the laundry, get the oil changed, whatever. Five or six things every day. But at the end of the day, when I'm able to look at that app and check off the boxes, there's this sense of accomplishment that wouldn't be there had I not made the plan. You remember the old saying, those who fail to plan, plan to fail. And every day to make a plan, here is how I want to use the day. I will not squander it. I do not wish to waste it. I've been given the gift of a new day. I want to do something with it, to make the plan and follow the plan. At the end of the day, there's this sense of accomplishment. We get in no other way. Um, how do we find life in its fullness? Reba said, well, you've got to have a wishbone. Dream, goal, plan. Secondly, you've got to have a backbone. Eventually, if we live our lives afraid to stand up and speak out or stand up and be counted for something we believe in, we've lived weak lives. Uh, now, when we stand up and be counted, uh, to be sure, a lot of people walk away. Because when you stand for that which is right and honorable and honest and godly, uh, it's rarely easy and even more rarely popular. People walk away. Our, our model for that is Jesus on the cross. You know, he was told, go back home to Capernaum. It's safe there. Hang out there. You can do some nice stuff. You'll lead a good life. But it says he set his face toward Jerusalem. It was not safe there. He didn't go there because it was easy. He went there because he thought in his soul, it's right. It's what God wants of me. And what happened? What happened was what they told him would happen. They nailed him to a cross. And when he was on the cross, every single disciple fled in fear. Only people that hung out were the women who had gone with him. They were the ones with courage. The guys hit the trail and hid behind locked doors. When we stand up for that, which is right, oftentimes others will walk away but it's still right. So many stories come from the tragedy of the Civil War, and we hope we'll never, ever see a time when we're divided like that again. And you know, in our area, where, where we live now, and on up through all the mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee and Virginia, uh, contrary to popular opinion, uh, there were split loyalties. About 60% of those who joined the military went to the Confederacy, and about 40% went to the Union Army. Now, even then, we were purple, and that's, that's the way history uh, unfolded in, that, in this area in that time. And we learned a lot of the stories um, through diaries that were found in people's homes. People wrote about what was happening and the hardships and the hard times. And up around Marshall, North Carolina, there was a diary discovered from a woman who remembered the day that her younger son went off to fight for the Confederacy. And she wrote about standing in the doorway. And there was the younger son going off to the army. And there was the older son who said, I will not go. And she said her heart was breaking for two reasons. One, she was afraid she would never see her younger son again. And second, she had seen those boys grow up closer than brothers, learning together, playing together, working together, loving each other, and now at this critical moment, acrimony. And she wrote of how the younger brother turned to his older brother 
and with, with venom in his voice and anger in his eyes, who said, you have brought shame on our family name by your cowardice and your refusal to fight. And the older brother answered, it is not cowardice. It is my conviction that I would bring shame on the family name if ever I raised my gun in defense of slavery. Brothers separated because of the stances that they took. Now pick out whatever issue matters to you. That war is over, by the way. Been over a long time. Not coming back. Pick out something right now in our age, in our lives that matters for you. What are you doing about it? Because if at some point we are afraid to stand up and speak out for that which is right, because we don't want to be left behind. And people walk away. Sometimes people we respect, sometimes people we need, sometimes people we love. But what price do we pay for remaining silent when God calls us to cry out? You know the old saying, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. If I'm always afraid to say, this is right, this is godly, this is true, if I'm always afraid, the time will come when I look in a mirror and there's nobody there but God in me, and I realize, yeah, I fell. I fell away from my principles. I fell away from my convictions. I fell away from what God was calling somebody to do. We don't stand for something, we fall for anything. But when we stand, people will walk away. They did with Jesus. I've come that you may have life and have it in its fullness. What do we have to do to receive that gift? Got to have a wishbone. Got to have a backbone, to be sure. And Reba said, you got to have a funny bone. (laughs) There comes a time when we have to laugh. And there's good biblical precedent for that. Years ago, Elton Trueblood wrote a book called The Humor of Christ. And he talked about how Jesus used humor that we don't get because we think he was the Messiah and he was always serious. No, he was the Messiah, but he was not always serious. Or he made serious points by the use of humor. Uh, He used puns. I tell you, you are Petra. And on this Petras, I build my rock. It was a pun in that day and age, using the name of Simon Peter and the name for rock. Uh, Can you not imagine, those of you who are old enough to remember Looney Tunes, uh, and I grew up on Looney Tunes and then eventually became it. Uh, (laughs) Can you not imagine a cartoon of an ophthalmologist looking for a speck in somebody's eye while there's a log stuck out of his own? Jesus used humor all the time to get across very serious points. If we don't sometimes learn to laugh, the seriousness of this world will overwhelm us until we are no longer able to address it. My mother, uh, much of her adult life, would go in and out of seasons of depression. She also uh, had... uh, keen sense of humor uh, that was uh, ribald and sometimes body. And uh, mom's the first person I heard say this. It's been around a long time. She heard it from somebody. You've heard it from somebody. But the reason I remember it from her is she owned it. She needed it. This was her mantra. She would say, I laugh to keep from crying. And there's a truth to that, you know. Sometimes we have to maintain. Author of Proverbs understood it. Laughter does good like medicine. It is sometimes the resource we lean on to get us through the valley of the shadow. We have to learn to laugh at some things in order to continue dealing with the seriousness of life in an effective way. And we have to learn to laugh at ourselves. Let me tell you, we preachers know that because everybody else is laughing at us. Uh, We may either join in or we're going to be real lonely. But we have to learn. When I was at Centenary down in Winston-Salem years ago, uh, I don't think I ever told you this story, but if I did, I'm going to tell you again. Uh, I had a a minister of visitation named Jack Yarbrough. And about 
three or four times a year, I would go to Arbor Acres and we'd reserve a room and we'd tell everybody who was sitting there, we had about 80 some people lived at Arbor Acres, went to our church, the pastor's here, woohoo, and uh, uh, you can come see him, you know, like that's a big deal. But they did because they were nice enough to want me to think that was important. And uh, so they would come and then Jack and I would go to the health care unit and see people who weren't able to come to the dining hall. And one day we were in the health care unit, and way down the hall, there was a woman in a wheelchair. And Jack said, see her? I said, yeah. He told me her name. He said she used to never miss a Sunday at St. Mary, ever. She sat at the very back, very back, because during the closing hymn, she would exit to get on the bus back to Arbor Acres for lunch. So he said, uh, you probably never met her. And I said, if she left during the closing hymn, no, I never met her. He said, well, I think it'd mean a lot to her to meet you now. So I walked down the hall. I will describe this exactly as happened. I walked down the hall. She's in her wheelchair. I bent over like this so that she and I are looking each other in the eye. And I introduced myself. She said, I know. I used to come to your church regularly. I said, I know. She said, I sat at the back. I said, yeah, I know you did. She said, so we never got to meet. She said, you know, that sanctuary is so long. If you sit at the back, you always look like you're about that big. And I said, well, it works both ways. When I'm up there in the pulpit, I look way to the back of the balcony. People, I said, you look like you were about that big. Quote, I'm bent over looking her in the eye. She said, you know, you look better from a distance. <laughs> Direct quote. I thought I was going to have to peel Jack off the floor from laughing. And I laughed too. I mean, first of all, it was true. And secondly, it was funny. And the times come that you just have to laugh to retain your sanity. Jesus did. There is, no matter how serious life becomes, there is still a light side to most things, and if we can find it and let it hold us up, then we are equipped to deal with that which is serious. Got to have a funny moment. We laugh to keep from crying. So Jesus said to the disciples, I have come that you might find life, the real full deal. Life in its fullness. What do we have to do to receive the gift that Jesus offers? God have a wishbone. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. God have a backbone. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. God have a funny bone. We laugh to keep from crying. I've come that you might have life in its fullness. Why on earth would anyone reject an offer like that? Let us pray. Oh God, move us past existing to living, truly living, faithfully living, fully living in you and for you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Closing hymn is number 364. I invite you to go forth knowing that Jesus himself said, I have come for this reason, that you may have life in all its fullness. <laughs>